Everybody, let's get started. Um, just a quick announcement. So you may have noticed that the uh, three lunch videos are not online yet. We're going to do that shortly. We have some technical problems. Sorry about that. Okay. So today we have uh, Amir, our own grad student. He's going to tell us about synchronization. Great. Okay, thanks. Hello, everyone. Uh, today's talk is going to be about synchronization strings, uh, which are very, very simple combinatorial objects that turn out to be very useful in a certain range of communication problems that have to deal with insertions and deletions. Uh, this talk is based on a joint work with my advisor, Bernard Hoefler, and this is part of my speaking skills requirement. So today's talk is not going to be very technical. I'm going to start with a very thorough introduction to error correcting codes. So what error correcting codes are. Then I'm going to introduce a variety of that problem with this coding, which is coding for insertions and deletions. Uh, then I'm going to review the previous work on both of these areas. Then we will proceed to the main results of today's talk, which is on codes for insertions and deletions. And during which I will introduce what synchronization strings are. And I'll conclude the talk with some further problems and directions that uh, you can use synchronization strings in to get better results. So, the best way to talk about error correcting codes is to think of the following scenario. Let's say you have two people, Alice and Bob, and Alice has a file, or like n messages that she wants to send to Bob. And each of these messages are chosen out of a set sigma that we will call the alphabet of the communication. Uh, she can send these messages over a given channel. And what happens in this channel is that there is an adversary, like a bad guy in the middle, who has the power to corrupt a certain fraction of these messages. So what will, received on the, what, what will be received on the other end is a distorted version of this <coughs> series of symbols. It will be the same thing up to like NP corruptions. Now, two famous types of corruptions that the adversary can do and people have thought about and studied about and has applications are symbol erasures and symbol substitutions. A symbol erasure corruption is simply adversary taking one of these symbols and then turning it into a question mark. So here, if adversary does like two erasures on the channel, and this is what Alice sends, what Bob would receive would be something like that. Another type of errors would be, another type of error that you can think of is symbol substitutions. In the previous slide, the M1 through MN, are those single characters? Yes, there are characters out of this set sigma, which is the alphabet of the communication. You're writing the string vertically, and the next slide, they're horizontal. Yeah. Okay. You're good. <laughs> it's great. But these are the same thing, basically. Each of these are like an MI. Uh, so yeah, I was talking about symbol substitutions. That is like adversary taking some of the symbols and then turning them into another symbol. That would be something like this. We pick this A, turn it into a C, and we pick this B and turn it into an A. And now, the goal in this problem is to try to have a reliable communication even though you know that there is some adversary which can possibly alter some of these messages. And error correcting codes are basically the natural solution to a problem of this sort. Uh, an error correcting code is simply a subset of sigma to the n, which is the set of all strings over alphabet sigma of length n. So, and we call sigma the alphabet and in the block length this is just some notation and we will refer to members of this subset or code as code words. Now the strategy that Alice and Bob has to employ is that Alice only commits to send one of the members of this subset. So Bob already knows that the string that Alice is going to send is one of the members of, this, of C. And we are looking for a good property which would allow Bob to uniquely recover what was the string that Alice has originally sent. Um, to see that what this good <coughs> property is, uh, think of all the strings of length n over alphabet sigma. 
Uh, I'm going to form a graph. I put a vertex for each member of this set here. And I connect two of those if they differ in only one position or have a distance of one. You can think of a distance over this set of nodes. The distance of two nodes would be like the number of positions that they differ in. And we call that, by the way, a Hamming distance between two strings. Now the Hamming distance of two strings in that set would be their distance over this graph. Uh, now the good property that we're looking for is that these, these members of the code C to be far apart from each other. Let's say, let's say we pick a code C that has the following property. For any two members of the code C that you pick, you would have that the distance between the, these two code words is at least some delta times n. And delta is a number between 0 and 1 because the distance is a number between 0 and n. I'm just normalizing here to define delta. Uh, now, if Alice sends one of these, an adversary does like k errors over that sent string. What we receive on the other end would be only k apart from the string that Alice has sent. In fact, if you think about balls of radius delta n over 2 around each of these code words, and you know that adversary is not going to do more than delta n over too many errors on the string that is being sent, you would know that for sure if, say, Alice sends a string here, what Bob would receive would definitely be in this ball. So he would be able to, and these balls are mutually exclusive because the distance is at least delta n, but the radius of the balls are delta n over 2. So Bob on the other end would be able to uniquely recover what was the string that Alice was supposed to send. Now, given that, we would say that a code C has a relative distance delta if for any pair of code words in code C, you have that the Hamming distance of those two code words is at least delta n. And what I just said was, <coughs> if you have a distance of d here, you would be able to correct from more or less d over too many symbol substitutions. Any questions here? Good. Uh, if you only think about designing codes with a certain distance, so you'd be able to like, correct from a certain fraction of errors. That is not really a hard problem. I can just pick a string of all zeros and a string of all ones. This would be a code with a super high distance. But if, <coughs> but if I do that, Alice will only have like two options. She can either send like zero to the n or one to the n. <coughs> and that is very, very inefficient in terms of communication because you have Basically, you have the capacity to send this many symbols, but you're using it only to convey like one bit of information. Choose one state out of two states, right? So what makes this problem interesting is that for a given distance delta, what is the, what is the code with the largest size that you can find? In other words, the larger the code C is, the better or the smarter the design of the code would be. To that end, I'm going to... Uh, do like just one more definition, and that is the rate of the code. If you have a code of size C, Alice is able to like basically send a message to Bob, and the type of the message is like choosing one state out of size of C many states, right? That is sort of like sending log C bits of information, log of the size of C many bits of information. Although if <coughs> there weren't any errors, he was able to send n symbols, and each of which would worth like log of size of sigma many bits of information. So this quantity rate basically shows how efficient your code is in terms of communication. How large, if this thing is small, it means that the overhead of your code is large. You are Compromising a lot for the sake of being able to resist against this adversarial error. And, well, before we get to that, it is pretty obvious that if you want 
codes with large distances. You, pretty, you probably are not able to have like too many vertices here. Like if there are too many vertices here, you are doomed. Like a couple of them should be like really close together. So the larger the distance that you want is, the smaller the rate would be. This is a kind of an obvious trade-off. Like if you want to protect against 90% of errors, these dots should be like really, really far from each other. So there, there couldn't be like too many of them here. So the size of the code would be small, so the rate would be small. And in fact, there is this like really nice trade-off. You can prove that if you want a distance of delta over a code of <coughs> block length n, your rate is at most 1 minus delta plus this term. So the larger the delta is, the stricter this upper bound would be. All good? OK. Uh, let's just give a very quick example. Let's say we have an alphabet of 2, block length of 3. This is all the strings of length 3. This is that graph that I talked about. And let's say we pick these two nodes. Now, the distance here is 3. The rate is, I'm, if Alice chooses to send one of these two, she is kind of sending one bit, but she has the capacity of sending three bits, so the rate would be one over three. And well, if you normalize the distance over the block length, you would get that the relative distance is one. And as I said, you can correct from more or less d over two many corruptions here. D, over, d minus one over two here is one. So if adversary does only one error, if Alice starts from here, what Bob would receive would be either this, 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 or this. But if Alice sends that one, what Bob receives would be either this one, this one, this one, or zero, zero, zero. So these are exclusive, and Bob can do the decoding. Also, you can show that if you have an error correcting code with distance d, uh, you'd be able to correct from d minus one symbol erasures. And the reason for that is like, each of these two code words differ in d positions. So with d minus one question marks, you can kill all of those, but there would still be one of them which would break the tie. Like in the receiving end, the receiver would be able to basically eliminate one of them. So if you have, again, if you employ the same strategy, you'd be able to have a communication that is resilient against almost these similar erasures. Clear? Uh, now I want to extend these two simple facts and say that in fact if Alice and Bob do this algorithm, like use an error correcting code and communicate over that, they can have a communication which is resilient against any E erasures and S substitutions as long as E plus 2 times S is less than D minus 1. This is obviously true at the extremes. but. Uh, I'm not going to really prove this, but it's easy to see. Let's, let's just add some vertices with question marks here. Like any edge that you have, just add a vertex in the middle of it. And for the position of disagreement, uh, swap it with a question mark. Like change it with a question mark. And extend this graph. Do this over all the edges. And add like the new edges. Do that over them as well. And in this new graph, an erasure would be like two edges, and it, oh, I'm sorry, an erasure would be like one unit of distance, and a substitution would be like two units of distance. <coughs> so as long as sum of the erasures plus twice the substitutions is less than this thing, you would still be in mutually exclusive balls, so you can do the decoding on the other end. Good? All right. Let's, let's see why this problem is important. Like what are the applications of error correcting codes? Uh, I believe most of you already know, but an obvious application would be anywhere that you want to have reliable communication. Like let's say you have a computer network. As you know, in computer networks, we send packets and sometimes, and nodes have to like reroute those packets. Sometimes because of congestion or some link failing for some physical reason, some of the packets get lost and don't arrive at the other end. That would be like a symbol erasure. So if you encode your file with an error correcting code, you would be able to recover it on the other end, even though there are some packets lost in the network. 
Another application would be wireless communication. These are communications that are obviously susceptible to noise. Let's say you are like uh, connected to internet on your phone and some truck passes by. The noise has like different frequencies, might destroy some of the uh, information that you are conveying with your phone. So you probably need to do some sort of error resilience scheme or error correcting code uh, over the information that you are uh, transferring <coughs> in applications like that. Another application is data storage. Like those of you who are old enough to have handled CDs on a daily basis know that sometimes you have like scratches. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes there can be like scratches happening like, behind your CD and <laughs> you want to be able to like read the data that is written on the CD even though there is like some damage on that. That would be where you can use error correcting codes to store data. Or in a larger scale, for example, like Google keeps all of your emails and you would be really mad if they lose, it, lose them. Even though they are keeping those data in big data centers, and these like racks of memory are, again, vulnerable to physical errors. So it might, as, it might happen that like, Google loses some of these racks of memory. So they should be able to keep your data, like reconstruct the lost data that was on that piece of memory, even though that is lost. So again, you can use an error correcting code here to make it sort of resilient to have uh, information lost. Okay. <coughs> so what I'm going to do right now, uh, so far I, I told you what error correcting codes are and why they're important to study. And I guess one problem which was naturally motivated by the things that I told you right now is that if I give you a n, a sigma, and a delta, like, and ask, uh, what, is the, what is the best code that you can give me over that block length, alphabet size, and distance? Like, what is the highest possible rate that you can get over all the codes with this block length, that alphabet size, and that distance? This is a very interesting problem. This is combinatorial. <coughs> um, but we are not going to be exactly thinking about this today. I'm going to rephrase this problem a little bit. And the motivation for that is, let's say you're designing a network of computers and you're having all these people sending files together and you want to make all of them, like help all of them to resist the errors that happen in the network. Somebody may be sending like a small 10 kilobyte text file, another person may be downloading like a two gigabyte movie. So, you, the question that you really have in your mind is that if you want to protect against delta fraction of errors, what is the best rate at which I can find a family of codes with different block lengths? An infinite family of codes, basically, with different block lengths uh, that can protect against delta and have a good rate. So the guy who wants to send a small file, choose a small code here and uses that to protect his file. The person wants to like send a large file, this is like an appropriate block length for that. And this is slightly different from <coughs> that combinatorial question for like one specific n. Uh, and again, ideally you might want to have like codes over any block length. But <coughs> sometimes we have certain nice structures, I don't know, over prime numbers that you can get like really good codes if this n is a prime number. And you don't really mind, if, if your file size is not a prime number, you can just pad it with some zeros and make it a prime number and use the appropriate error correcting code here. So you don't really need to have codes for any block length. You just need to have like an infinite family of codes with increasing block length. So you would find an appropriate block length no matter what's the size of the file that you want to encode. And so, <clears throat> I'm going to relax this problem a little bit as well. Instead of requiring all of them to have a rate R, uh, 
let's say they can have different <coughs> rates, but we only want the limit of the rate to go to r, some constant. And we are interested in the limit of the r as n grows to infinity. This way, if you, if you want to get close to, I mean, probably a better way to talk about this is that like the larger the alphabet is, or the larger the block size is, the easier the problem of coding might get because you can like scramble more stuff together and do like smarter ideas. So naturally, you might expect to have better rates as this n grows. But if you have a family of codes that has a rate which, conver which converges to some r, you know that for a large enough n, you would get as close as you wish to this r. And so generally, these codes can be defined over different alphabets. But, and that makes the problem easier a little bit, like Reed solomon codes, which you might have heard of, or codes over alphabets that where the alphabet sizes actually grows linearly in terms of this n. But today we are going to consider only families of codes over a fixed alphabet size. In other words, the question that we are dealing with would be like, if you give me a delta, can I point out a specific alphabet and give you a family of codes whose rate converts to some r? <coughs> and what is the possible r that it can do so? I'm a little confused, because suppose you may have a block length of a billion. Mm -hmm. If you think about a binary string, then chances are you're never going to get a block to go through without an error. So, but somehow the model says that you very seldom get an error for this huge block. Uh, so, this is I mean, this is not the alpha, but this is cheating to sort of allow the block size to grow and then, but not increase your error rate as you, as the block size grow. Or is that maybe in the formula already? Actually, yeah. Right? Like, I mean, it's if you have a block of size two. Mm -hmm. then 10% then then of that would be like 2 times 10%. But if you have a, like a code of length 2,000, 10% of error would be like 200 corruptions in there, right? So we have 10%, if you had a 1% error, mm -hmm. the block length is a billion, mm -hmm. then no block would come. You, you, every, every block would be corrupted, right? Uh, not really, why? Like we have a fixed alphabet. Let's say alphabet is binary. What I'm saying is that I have an error correcting code for like block length of 10, which is like 10 bit strings. And I have another error correcting code for uh, like a 1 billion length strings. But these are, so the first one would protect against 10% of 10, which is like one errors. The second one would protect against 10% of 10 billion. So the error resilience is higher. It's just the same in terms of percentage, right? The block, the error, okay. So the block has errors. Right. right. Okay. And of course, like another question is like how fast this encoding and decoding works. Like how fast, if you give me a number between one and C, I would be able to construct the code word. And how fast would be the algorithm that gets it close by code word and finds the original string. Now, everything that I talked about today was about, so far was about Hamming type errors or half errors. But there are other types of error that one can think of, which are insertions and deletions. A deletion is simply deleting a symbol without leaving any sort of placeholder there. So if you have a string like this, and delete those two Cs, the resulting string would be something like that. And an insertion is the other way, just pushing something in there, and then pushing everything one unit forward. So if I insert these two at the both ends of that string, the results of string would be this. So in your example, those are mm -hmm. block lengths of eight bits? Here, the so block is eight symbols. <coughs> Yes, so eight, eight symbols. The alphabet is like larger than two is three because we have A and B and C. So it's 26 or whatever, so it's at seven bits? Yes. So you're saying the block length is seven? Yes, yes. But your error, but the failure though is, is then per character, per eight bits, right? It's if any one bit in that eight, seven bits is corrected, corrupted, then you get an error, right? Oh, no, 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 no. Like that's like two errors. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But then I claim it's cheating because if I have a billion characters and I'm only going to allow it to be corrupted, you know, you, I have to, I, I, they come through perfectly every time a billion bits except for one in 10%. Mm -hmm. Then that would be amazing, right? I mean, that I get a billion, only get an error every one or two times per billion bits. I don't no, no, maybe one or two, one two times per. Well, right? That's why you want to bring down the alphabet size. Because yeah, but that's. 
I think he's talking about black link, not the no, alphabet. Okay. No, no, I think, no, yeah, I think he's, he's upset that, that he's upset the alphabet size. He's talking about the alphabet, alphabet size, which is large. Exactly plays into your... Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's the alphabet size. Like if this, if I have like, if I choose by, instead of bits, I have like 26 different symbols here. Yeah, that, it's not really cheating, but that would be an easier problem. No, but, uh, well, because the previous slide you basically had, how you can choose a large alphabet. Like, you know, nobody gave you power of choosing al uh, alphabet in the applications you mentioned. Right, you know, it's still you can when you fix channel. I mean, you fix the when you're designing like a network of computers, you can choose the size of your packet, right? Uh, Just want it to be some constant. You don't want it to vary like with the size of the file. So then you need to keep the constant. So size, you know, if you sign it 10, 10 terabytes right. of packets, yeah, the probability one they're going okay. to be lost. That's like if you have a, yeah, if you have the same chance of like losing each bit, that's correct. Yes, it, that makes, yeah, I think I got what you're talking about. Yeah, that makes the problem easier. Not really cheating, though, but <laughs> <laughs> makes it easier. I don't understand why it's not, because you think then that if, if we decide on packets of a billion bits, then we'd never get any through, right? They would all fail. Mm, yeah, but you, you, in real life, you don't have any channels that only like chooses a chunk of one billion and, you know. But this is just, scary. I'm sure that your ability is small here. See, maybe we can discuss it like a little bit afterwards because... I'm, I'm just saying, but I didn't make a nice big nut round number that it was a modern number that young okay. kids should consider a constant. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So anyway, we'll okay. discuss it offline yeah, afterwards. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, no, no problem. And yeah, the point is like if you have... Even a small number of insertions and deletions can like shift everything around and can end up with like a really large hamming distance. So these synchronization errors are really harder than half errors. In fact, you can see that they are strictly harder because like an erasure is like a deletion plus knowing where that deletion has happened. And a substitution is like a deletion and insertion in the same position. And again, for insertions and deletions, you can think of codes. Like we define this new notion of distance between two strings. Edit distance of two strings would be the minimum number of insertions and deletions that you need to do to turn one into another. And over this, you can think about the same graph have the same definition of the insertion deletion code, same definition for distance, rate, and you would have the singleton bound in the same way. And again, we would have the questions of like, what is the best family of codes that I can find to protect against a certain fraction of insertions and deletions. Now, this problem also has applications. I hope so. Uh, like that thing that I talked about, about networks and packets. If a packet is dropped somewhere in the middle, you don't really know that it has been dropped. So the type of the error is really a deletion and not a like erasure or a hamming type error. Unless you do something else, like have some sort of ID inside the packet using which you can like, you can know that something is missed. But if you're just looking at the packets, some of them might be missing. You don't really know that there was something that is not here. So it would really act as a deletion error. Same thing with radio communication. Sometimes you have like receivers that get triggered if on a certain frequency you have a certain strength. And <coughs> if noise happens and the antenna gets triggered, you would read a new packet even though like there is nothing sent. That's like an insertion. And there is this other cooler application which is about like DNA data storage, which it's basically about trying to uh, keep data in synthetic strands of DNA instead of using transistors. And as you might know, when we are dealing with DNAs, reading, writing, and preserving even, uh, comes with the problem of like having certain substrings removed or copied twice, which are all synchronization type errors. So it's really important to know how to code against these type of errors in these applications. Let's take a quick look at the previous work done in these two areas. For error correcting codes, the problem started in late 40s with Shannon's work. Then we had like famous Hamming's work. Uh, we got Reed Solomon codes in the 60s, which, which are a family of codes which attain that singleton bound, but on uh, alphabet sizes that are not constant. Like if you want a Reed Solomon code, that's actually, I guess, a good point for your question. Read Solomon code of length n is defined over alphabet of size n. Each symbol is of size n. They're still interesting. They're very important, like, uh, object encoding theory, but not necessarily 
Like, so it's not cheating, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and then in 66, we had like Forney's PhD thesis, which, using which people could find like codes that are basically polynomially off from the singleton mod. Like if you have a distance delta, you expect to have a rate of like one minus, to rate, a rate, the, the upper bound that singleton mod gives you is like one minus <coughs> delta. But these codes could get close to that up to some polynomial distance. Now for insertion deletion codes, <coughs> first time the problem was brought up was in 60s by Levenstein, and it took us like 40 years, not us, to the community 40 years to find the first uh, family of error correcting codes that are, that just have some constant distance delta and some constant rate r, and are defined over a constant alphabet sigma, which is some large constant again. <coughs> Uh, and in 2006, a couple of works of Venkat and his students uh, pretty much provided the same family of codes as like Forney's codes, but for insertions and deletions. So from this slide, you can see our understanding of insertion deletion codes is really like 50 years behind of our understanding of ordinary error correcting codes. Because in these 50 years, like we had so many amazing results. Uh, great works on normal error correcting codes. And in fact, our understanding of error correcting codes today is very sophisticated. It's impressively sophisticated. You know lots of stuff. And I'd like to quote this sentence from a 2009 survey of Mitzemacher, in which he said, given the near complete knowledge we have for channels with erasures and errors, our lack of understanding about channels with synchronization errors is truly remarkable. With that being said, I'm ready to present the main result of today's talk. Using these things that I'm gonna call a synchronization string, I'm gonna give you a way to, let's say you give me an error correcting code with these parameters. I can pick any epsilon as small as I wish between zero and one. And somehow convert that error correcting code into an insertion deletion code, which is almost equally as good. It is defined over the same block length. It only has a distance which is only slightly smaller than delta. The alphabet size is still some constant. It's the original alphabet size times some constant that only depends on epsilon. This is what this means. And a rate which is close to R with some terms and conditions. This is actually R times some other term that that term would be really close to one if this alphabet size is large enough. Today, the alphabet size is large enough, so I'm not going to write it down here. Actually, I wrote it down here last time, and I failed my speaking skills, so I'm not going to do that today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, you can basically use this to translate so many of those amazing things that we already know about error correcting codes to the realm of insertion deletion codes. What Please. about encoding and decoding them? Uh, it only adds a linear time to the encoding procedure and a quadratic time. Or even, you can do it like linear, linear time. Uh, the to the constant is reasonable. Uh, linear times the constant. Yes. Oh, oh. No, you have like an, I believe you have an additive term which uses a brute force on epsilon. So, you know, no, yeah. Um, specifically, <coughs> there is this paper by Venkat and Piotr Indyk 2005, where they find really good families of codes. Like for any delta that you pick, they, they will give you a family of codes that have a rate of almost one minus delta, just with a little bit of the additive uh, gap here. And you can pick that additive gap yourself. It can be as small as you wish. And this is a very strong theorem. And using that conversion, you can get the same result for uh, insertion deletion codes. Basically, you take a code from this paper with this rate, this distance, and over this alphabet, and you apply this conversion over each and every member of that family of codes. You would get a new family of codes, pretty much the same rate. Distance is a little bit smaller. Alphabet size is a little bit larger, but still a constant. And the rate converges to the same thing, almost, which is close to one minus the new rate 
up to some additive gap that still you can control because you picked both epsilon here and epsilon prime here yourself, right? Well, let's just quickly go and see what these, uh, so yeah, the summary of this, to sum up this result, I can just say this one sentence theorem thing, that for any distance that you pick and any small epsilon that you pick, I will give you a family of efficient insertion deletion codes that can correct from delta fraction of errors with this rate. The rest of this talk is going to be about this. So it's kind of independent from what I've said so far. To see how that works, let's think that Alice and Bob are talking over a insertion deletion channel. And Alice wants to send this. For the moment, let's say she can magically attach the index of each symbol to it and then send it through. And then the bad guy does some, let's say, two deletions. He deleted three and eight. And on the other end, when Bob receives this, he can just look at the indices and recover the positions of these symbols. So he basically can recover a string like this with original symbols plus some question marks. So if you have this indexing, magical indexing scheme employed in here, you can translate any k insertions and deletions into k half errors, k question marks. Same story goes with insertions. Like if you have a couple of insertions, for some positions you have like multiple candidates, so you don't really know what that was. And also works for like a combination of insertions and deletions. When you have combinations, sometimes adversary may remove the original symbol and replace it with something, so you might have like incorrectly decoded symbols here, but that also counts as two half errors, which is happened by two insertions and deletions. So still, if you have this mechanism, you can translate like k half errors, uh, k insertions and deletions into k half errors. Uh, and basically this would give you an insertion deletion code, right? Because Alice and Bob can agree upon like an error correcting code that corrects from k half errors, and then this string would be a code word of that code. Now if I just attach these things, to any symbol of any code word of uh, code word that Alice and Bob have been chosen to work on, the resulting thing would protect against k insertions and deletions. Therefore, it would be an insertion deletion code with distance k. Right? But there is a problem in this. Can anybody see that? This doesn't really give the conversion that I wanted. What is that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Basically, you can convert a given error correcting code into an insertion deletion code using this, but you would need your alphabet size to be at least log n bits or n to fit these symbols into the like symbols of your communication. Now, this is cheating, actually. <laughs> you can do this. This wouldn't give you a family of codes that you wanted. So. The idea of synchronization string is to, instead of using this trivial string of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we use a string over finite alphabet, over some finite, finite alphabet. So that would give us pretty much the same guarantee. Translate k insertions and deletions into almost k half errors, just some extra additive errors. And I guess we can agree that this would give us the conversion that we need. Now, yeah, I have like around eight minutes, and I'm gonna use those eight minutes to like introduce these synchronization strings and say how they work. Uh, let's say we have a string S, and I write down two copies of S like next to each other. Uh, a monotone matching between these two would be like a bunch of edges here that connect a symbol to an identical symbol and the edges cannot cross each other. And you're not allowed to connect something to the corresponding position, so you cannot have like vertical edges. So to call a string epsilon self-similar, if you cannot find any matchings that have more than epsilon and edges here. And a synchronization string is simply a string whose er like every substring of whom is epsilon self-similar. That's just the hereditary expansion of the epsilon self-similarity. 
With respect to the substrings length or with respect to the original length? Substring length. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the smaller this epsilon is, the harder this, like the more restrictive this property would be. Like in fact, what is a zero synchronization string? You shouldn't be able to find like any non-vertical edges that connects. Does the substring here have to be continuous? Yes, yes. That's that's like a continuous. That's, thanks. That was a good. That was a good question. A continuous subset of. No, these. it's not continuous. It's a s subsequence. Substring. 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 So any substring should not have like too many, two identical subsequences. That's. We can talk about them later. Yeah, but a zero self-similar string would be a string that doesn't have any two, uh, any repetitive symbols. So it would be just one, two, three, four, two, n, the same trivial thing that I talked about in the previous slide. And I guess we only need to show that if you use these strings in that indexing scheme, you would be able to translate edit errors into half errors, like insertions and deletions into half errors. And of course, I should prove that you can actually find arbitrarily long strings like this, <coughs> like they exist over some constant alphabet. And it'd be nice to be able to construct them because we want to use them in an encoding procedure, right? These are the only two remaining steps. So if you took the numbers in binary and concatenate them, that's all, what was that? That's all similar? Uh, here, like in this definition? No, just took numbers in binary concatenated. You know, zero, oh. oh, I one. see. You know, zero. I mean, you just concatenated the numbers of binary. Um, that was your original code, right? Not true. No. Or if you go back mm -hmm. with Alice and Bob, you had the numbers, quote, you were proposing to put them in binary, right? Mm -hmm. Ah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Is OK, sorry, yeah. Please. Back again. Go Alice. Here, there. What? One, two, three. Probably you'd write those in binary, right? No, no, this is just. And the, you, well, you said there was a log in there, so normally that would assume that would, because you were writing 10. Yeah, at least one, two, three, four are like. Um, so this is your symbol. This is the alphabet of the communication. And you're feeding some message and some index in it. Right. So if you use a gray code or whatever to code that's self similar, I just don't understand that. I'm trying to understand it under the obvious definition. What happens if you use a gray code or whatever, binary code? Uh, first of all, gray codes like have, you can't really find them over binary alphabets because you have like two zeros next to each other and that would be like a self-similar string of length two because you have like a substring of length two and like one edge. You see what I mean? So you really need larger alphabets unless you relax like the definition. <coughs> Let me bring the definition here. So that question would be equal to like writing code words of a gray code next to each other, and then see if I can find like a large non-vertical matching here. And I really don't know if that works for gray codes. Or not? Really, this is a bit of a mess number. It's self dissimilar of strings, not self-similar. Right, right, and the point was the self-similarity should be at most epsilon. Uh, right. OK, fine. <laughs> Yeah, the zero self-similar is a string which has zero self-similarity. Yeah, it should be this thing. So there's some reason it didn't match the ones at the beginning? What was that? The two ones at the beginning. Oh, you cannot, I'm not allowing matching like, this is too simple. Like if you allow these edges, you can find the matching of size n. Just match anything to the corresponding position there. I'm saying like, you cannot have too many. <laughs> good, good. That was a good question for me, I didn't understand it. Okay. And it's non-crossing or something, right? So yeah, the edges should not. It's basically like two subsequences that are identical, but you're not really ch you're not having same positions in those subsequences. <coughs> yeah, and for construction, I have to show that for any epsilon that you pick, there is some finite alphabet over which I can find like synchronization strings of any length. So let's start with the construction. I'm not really gonna tell you how. I'm just gonna give you like one theorem from these two works like that sums up like very sophisticated
construction of synchronization strings. For any epsilon that you pick, there exists an infinite epsilon synchronization string uh, over an alphabet of this size, which doesn't really matter. It's something that only depends on epsilon. That's the point. Such that you can construct any prefix of it in linear time. So if you need a synchronization string of length n, you can find it in O of n time. They're constructible in linear time. And also you can construct any ith position in O of log i time. This is good because you can do it in parallel. If you have like multiple processors, you can construct a synchronization string essentially in logarithmic time. This is it. And let's just see quickly how the decoding works. Uh, to see that, I need to show that if Alice sends a bunch of messages which is indexed with a synchronization string i, Bob would be able to like basically reconstruct like recover the position of these messages in a way that he would only end up having up to pretty much the same amount of half errors. I'm just going to describe the algorithm like really quick. The details are not super important. I just want to sh want to show you that the algorithm is really simple. What Bob does is he simply finds, he knows what this synchronization string is. So he knows the second part. He knows what to expect here on the second position. So, but just looking at the second position, he tries to find the longest common substring between what he has received and what he expected to receive. And assigns each symbol that is matched to the corresponding position. So he thinks of this as a fifth symbol, thinks of this as a second symbol, so on and so forth. Of course, at times, he might be wrong. This might be the actual correspondence between what was sent and what was received. But any time that he is wrong, like he does a wrong detection, you know that I prime 4 is equal to I prime 5 because he found like the longest common substring. These are like similar things. And this actually corresponds to this one. So I4 also has to be equal to I prime 4. So we would have like two elements here in this synchronization string that are similar to each other, that are identical. And we know by the definition of synchronization string that you cannot have too many of these. The property of synchronization string was you can only find like a small number of cell similarities in it. So in each time he finds a matching and does this like matching procedure, he would only make a small number of mistakes. Basically, n epsilon mistakes because of that epsilon self-similarity property. Now, the problem here is if he only does this one time, there might be like a large number of these symbols here that are not matched yet. So the way algorithm like continues uh, working is just removing these things and then again finding another longest common subsequence between the remaining symbols and what he expected to receive. And you can show that if you do this thing sufficiently many times, most of these symbols would be matched. In fact, a little bit of details would be like, if you do this one over square root of epsilon times, you would only have n times this small thing, square root of epsilon, many symbols that are not matched here. And that, so, okay. At the end of the algorithm, you have some positions that are like uniquely matched to some symbol here. You would, you would guess that the position of this symbol, you would guess that at the first position you, would, you, you have received this symbol. You might have some positions that you have multiple matches to. Just declare a question mark for that. It's ambiguous, you don't know which one it is. And you might have positions that you have no matches to. Declare a question mark for that as well. And you can show that if you do this algorithm, you're not gonna have, basically, the number of erasures and corruptions that you would have here in the reconstructions would add up to almost the same number of insertions and deletions plus some small term in terms of half errors. <coughs> in fact, a little bit of math, if you start from n delta insertions and deletions, first of all, this is the runtime of the algorithm because we are doing just a constant number of longest common subsequences, which is very simple, just the dynamic programming. You would end up with your original n delta errors plus this term, which is, I did this many matchings. In each matching, I had this many wrong detections. So that would be the total 
total half errors that stem from like the <coughs> wrong deten detections in each round that I find the longest gamma subsequence. And a third term which comes from those vertices here that are not matched. And if you sum it up, you'll get something like this, which is almost the number of insertions and deletions that I had, plus this small addi additive term, that you can make a small because you are the person who's choosing epsilon. The definition of the string said that for every substring, um, it must be dissimilar. Uh, yeah, here you I don't need that. I see where you involve exactly. that. Exactly. So this is this is the simplest way of decoding synchronization strings, which works in quadratic time. Synchronization. Actually, you only need self-similarity on the original string to have this decoding algorithm. But there are like more sophisticated decoding algorithms for synchronization strings that work in like near linear time or like have certain properties, those need that stronger notion. And yeah, that's why. I just wanted to have this like, because this is reasonably simple to be said at a speaking skills talk, I hope so. And so you can see that it's like, it's easy to implement. The proof is fairly easy, like you can understand it in five minutes. And yet it's so powerful and so helpful. So this doesn't work for GCP, right? Yeah. That's where you'd know packets lost if you tell them when they set resend it or whatever. Yes, yeah, I mean, there you only need like here ordinary. You'd have, to, you'd have to download the whole movie and then you would have to go and say, I'm missing or whatever, right? Yes, or. You have to assume that you're going to get the whole movie before you go around. Yeah, here, here you have a delay. You, you have everything in the beginning and do the encoding. And then after receiving everything, you do the decoding, so. And you can't even start watching the movie before you've downloaded the whole thing or not? There are decoding algorithms that have that property that you can like stream with it, basically just decode by looking at it. But this is not, this doesn't have that property. Okay, almost out of time. So just let's mention the takeaway message and leave the further application for those of you who are more interested and would read my papers. Uh, what I did today, I introduced synchronization strings. They had like this very simple, easy to define uh, property. They had like, they like very simple objects. It showed that you can construct them in a fast fashion. They do exist. And I showed that a fairly simple decoding algorithm would give you a translation of k insertions and deletions into almost the same number of k plus um, epsilon n number of half errors. And if you have these three ingredients together, you can basically do that conversion that I promised in my main results slide. And that would give you this family of codes. Again, here we are actually just doing this conversion and then stand on the shoulders of this giant. But that's, that's I guess, the beauty of this conversion. You can like, translate so many interesting things from error correcting codes into insertion deletion codes without really being involved with the complications. And yeah, I guess that's it. Another question. So is a random string over a big enough alphabet a synchronization string? Yes, actually. So, so how big they have to be or something? It doesn't matter. So you have a parameter here. Like if you want to have an epsilon synchronization string, okay. your alphabet should be, I think if the alphabet is like epsilon to the minus four or something like some polynomial in terms of one over epsilon, a random string would be, would be self-similar, not a synchronization string. Because, yeah. When we're talking about synchronization strings, you have this like, you cannot really have two similar, two identical symbols back to back, to back because that would, that would violate the property of, that string of length two wouldn't be a synchronization string because you want that property over each subset. And if you have a random string, you, that will happen at some point. You would have like two identical. With local lemma? Yeah, yes. With local, with Lovash local lemma, you can show that random string would satisfy this property over large enough alphabets and then you can like concatenate it with a with another string which satisfies the property on like shorter intervals or like yeah i hope oh please one reason tcp uh, numbers packets is because of loss but another reason is for reordering like things may arrive out of order oh i see and so does 
this hmm. like this like your original indexing thing seems like it would work for out of order. I wonder whether that synchronization string would help for out of order arrival. That is that is kind of like insertions and deletions, right? Because you have like one, two, three, four, five, and then five might be deleted and inserted like at the first position. So yeah, I would you might like lose a constant factor because like one reordering is equal to like two. But still I would I, I think you'd get codes that can protect against those as well.